Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to, because I'm sitting up here with three military officers, I'm going to try to start our session on time uh, in, a, in a nod to your, I think, close to 100 years of probably military experience. It's a great honor for me to be up here with um, General Ron Fogelman, the former Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Pete Corelli, the former Vice Chairman of the Army, or sorry, Vice Chief of, <laughs> Chief of Staff of the Army, and, and General Cartwright, uh, the former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Um, and I think you all have their bios in your programs. It's honors and accolades and, and a diversity of experience and expertise that is um, really remarkable. One of the things I think is interesting about the three of them is um, their representation of their three different service branches, but all uh, attended command and staff or war, war college in some other services institution, and I don't know if that's a reflection of the fact that all of them are known individually for being um, among the more broad-minded within their respective services or, um, I don't know, or um, willing to challenge the uh, conventional wisdom, I think, or if it's a result of that, but either way, again, I think it's sort of an interesting note about the three of them. Um, so I think we're going to try to engage in this conversation about what we've learned after the last 12 years in Iraq and Afghanistan with what uh, Elliot Cohen called the historical mind as opposed to the strategic mind, trying to figure out how to place this experience in the context of a broader history. Um, what kind of a framework does that experience offer? Uh, not a template, but but what does it teach us that's relevant about the future? Um, in the, the magazine of articles that we put out for today's uh, conference, I, I offered a couple of thoughts on that about changes that have come about both with the integration of uh, conventional and special operations forces and also operations and intelligence activities and also the use of unmanned platforms, but um, those are just a few of the many examples of how things changed in the course of uh, the, the 12 years of war in two different theaters. And I hope to, uh, these three are, are much better equipped than am I to reflect on what some of the more fundamental changes may have been and what they import going forward. So General Fogman is going to kick off our discussion with some thoughts on um, the use of precision strike and reach back and some other issues along those lines. I think General Corelli is going to um, address some, some topics about how, what the military used to, learned about using some of the more non-kinetic means and um, may, may raise some of his thoughts on the importance of not, what many would consider to be non-traditional military activities. And then I've asked General Cartwright to offer some broader strategic thoughts about uh, what the last 12 years may mean in the context of uh, policy discussions between the national security staff and the Congress and the nation at large and, and what kinds of things have we learned that align with future challenges. So we'll go through each of those things. We'll have a few uh, questions and exchange amongst ourselves and then we'd really like to open it up for all of you um, to have you address some of, have them address some of your thoughts and questions. So. With that, General Fogelman, thanks so much. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I thought that I would, uh, when asked, uh, if, if you look back over the last 12 years, uh, what are a few things that, uh, that stick out in your mind relative to uh, the way the conflict has unfolded? Uh, one uh, is precision, precision not only in strike but in location. For amazingly enough, as, as uh, many of us would be uh, not uh, willing to admit on occasion, we never knew where we were when we were flying. We knew where we were close to being or where we should have been, but we always didn't always know where we were. I suspect the guys on the ground always knew precisely where they were, so that's not a big <laughs> issue for them. But I, I was going to talk. <laughs> I hope somebody had that on tape. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit on that. The other, as uh, Marin mentioned, is uh, reach back, just a quick look and 
and uh, definition of what I talk about on reach back. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about UAVs. And finally, to, di to give the enemy uh, some due, uh, I thought another subject that might be worth talking about is uh, IEDs. So uh, with that, uh, when I look at the precision thing and I go back in history, you know, to World War II, uh, whether you were an artilleryman, whether you were on a naval ship with naval gunfire, or you were part of the air campaign in Europe, uh, what you talked about when you were using weapons was uh, a requirement to put a lot of mass downrange or off the thing. So it was a question of how big does the bomber formation have to be to destroy this particular aim point? And, uh, and then uh, uh, it, it evolved over time to uh, the first Gulf War, where we began to see the impact of precision, but precision during that war was more driven by laser-guided weapons than it was GPS kinds of weapons. And uh, of course, we had the tank plinking campaign. We had a lot of things there that started to show us the potential. And then as we got into Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the real payoff in terms of precision guided weapons, uh, the so-called JDAMs, uh, the, uh, the whole idea that uh, GPS enabled you to now ask the question, how many targets can I strike with a single airplane when I individually uh, target each weapon coming off. And that progressed naturally into the point now where the Army has GPS-guided mortar shells, GPS-guided 155-millimeter shells. And um, so as you, as you start to think in a broader sense, what does this really pretend? Uh, I think it has uh, long-range ramifications in, in terms of force structure. Do you need as many platforms? Do you need the same kind of ammunition stocks that you had in the past uh, as you have uh, before? And so force structure is one thing I think that gets impacted by precision. We don't always think about that, but as programmers you would. The other thing is logistics. Uh, it cuts down somewhat on the logistics tail. Talk about reach back uh, very briefly. Um, you know, um, Reach back, in my view, is the ability to put in the rear area, uh, and I will call the rear, rear area the continental United States, but it could be somewhere other than on the battlefield, uh, certain capabilities that historically you had to bundle up, send forward. They were part of the deployment package. They were the part of the footprint that you had to defend. And two that kind of stri uh, strike me is, uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, I, I think that uh, over the years we've done a pretty good job of being able to uh, maintain an intelligence capability stateside that can do the analysis, even do some targeting, and send that stuff forward. Of course, the, the big uh, choke point becomes bandwidth, and that's a whole other discussion. And of course, uh, UAVs. The UAV thing has more and more, uh, uh, we've stood up more and more command and control centers in the United States, so somebody can be sitting out in uh, Nellis Air Force Base, or if you're a guard individual up in North Dakota, you can be up there flying a combat uh, sortie in support, or a sortie in support of combat troops. So again, it has all these uh, very positive things. Uh, in terms of footprint and this sort of thing. But it has a negative thing, too. And this is an interesting phenomena that, that really started to come up during the last 12 years, is if you're the commander, if you're a combatant commander out there, um, you kind of like to be able to look the people in the eye that are supporting you. And this whole concept of battle buddies and the whole idea that uh, it's nice that you provide me this service, but I... <laughs> Quite frankly, I'd like you to be a little bit miserable with me. You know, if there's a dust storm, I'd like you to understand there's a dust storm. If there's, you know, whatever it's like. So there is a downside, I guess, if, if you, if the battle buddy lack of that in the bandwidth. And then into UAVs, you know, UAVs, very, very interesting. 
um, the, the net result that you want to get out of UAVs, uh, at least uh, you know, initially and primarily, was intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR. This is not a new concept. You know, I mean, when you go back to uh, the Korean War, it was kind of the first time that we really introduced, there were some liaison airplanes, et cetera, during the Second World War, but in the Korean War, we introduced this idea of mosquito aircraft. You know, they were old T6 trainers, and they were fax, forward air controllers. And so you didn't have the national means, uh, you, didn't, uh, you didn't have these unmanned systems, but you tried to provide the same kind of capability. And, um, and then you got into Vietnam, and in Vietnam, uh, we tried to provide 24-7, uh, 365 coverage of the battlefield with facts, flying uh, O-1s, O-2s, OV-10s, things like this. And if you think about it in the simplest sense, these were aerial machines that uh, could stay up for five or six hours. They carried a payload of about uh, 150 to 200 pounds, called a pilot. And they had a sensor system, which was generally eyeballs or sometimes uh, night scopes, this kind of thing. And so uh, what we ended up replacing that with uh, when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan were the unmanned systems uh, that we've known. And uh, then uh, arming these systems made them more than just intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance platforms. And that's, that's I think, where we're going in the future as we look at this. Interestingly enough, we've seen, because they've been so effective, we've seen some pushback on these things. And it comes within the policy perspective. Um, you know, the use of these things in uh, places like Yemen and Pakistan. We're, we're starting to see uh, human rights groups, uh, international law, and in fact, uh, it's having an effect, I believe. I just recently saw an article where the uh, number of UAV strikes in Pakistan is down somewhere like 37% and in Yemen. And it, I think it's a, it reflects a policy sensitivity on the part of the administration. And then my last subject is to throw out is IEDs. Again, historically, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I, I guess the IED part of it maybe, but you know, anybody around in Vietnam, you remember the old bamboo stakes and uh, you know, all kinds of these things, they were there. The, the, even in Vietnam, I remember as a fighter pilot, um, the greatest sin in the world was to drop a dud bomb because you knew the bad guys were gonna get it, they were gonna do something with it to do bad things to your friends on the ground. Uh, as we got into uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and more people on the ground, uh, this, uh, this was taken to a whole new level, if you will, uh, in terms of greater leth lethality, and the, and the whole idea of suicide bombers, which you know, we really hadn't had to deal with. So I guess these are four things that I would say, um, as I look back in the last 12 years, there's certainly more, but these are some that stick out in my mind. Okay. Right. Uh, I am sitting on a commission on military compensation and retirement organization, so if I break into actuarial pay, uh, table, please excuse me. I don't know where I am. <laughs> it's a good break to get over here. <laughs> All of the veteran service organizations. Um, let, let, let me cover a few of the things that Ron covered because I think it's, it's kind of critical. I mean, I, one of the things that uh, I start pulling my hair out as a vice is when we went ahead and, and deployed the precision mortar shell round. Um, because all of a sudden I was deploying a $1,200 round um, that used to cost someone in the vicinity of $60, putting in the hands of a, a real good E6 because you probably never had a mortar platoon leader, or if you did, he was a brand new lieutenant. Uh, and we were doing that at a time of war without having the opportunity to train tactics, techniques, and procedures on when to shoot it and when not to shoot it. I, I remember when uh, my ABO, my budget officer, uh, went over to uh, Afghanistan and he was watching the firing of a 155 precision round uh, on some IED emplacements. Uh, these, this was the early time of this particular round and it was going for uh, somewhere in the vicinity of $110,000. And as these guys were digging in the round and going from hole to hole, 
uh, they started shooting these things. And you know, for, for the people who were watching it uh, on the TV camera, it was great sport. But for him, all he could see was dollar signs. Because <laughs> just, just as the fire mission went in, the guys crossed the street to go over to the, to the next hole they were going to dig in. And he, he saw three of these fires uh, at a point when um, a, a, a simple battery uh, of the old $60 rounds probably would have done the job a heck of a lot better uh, as $330,000 went flying down range. That, that's one of the issues when you, when you get into uh, precision strike. Um, we, especially the Army, need new tactics, techniques, and procedures. Reach back was always interesting for me because there was a great push based on force levels to leave as much at home as you possibly could. But it was always this idea that the person back at home wasn't necessarily working 24-7. Um, they had other things that were drawing on their time. Uh, when I, my crisis did not, not always correspond with their kids' soccer games, um, a wife's birthday, a vacation, or whatever. Uh, and there wasn't that same feeling, uh, as Ron indicated, that they were there to support you. And finally, UAVs. I'm afraid that um, these conflicts will be remembered for the proliferation of UAVs, and that's true. But I will tell you, uh, when I left Iraq in December of 2006, um, the Corps commander uh, in Iraq had one UAV 18 hours a day. Now, that changed very, very rapidly in 2007 and 2008. Uh, but they always weren't uh, at the level that uh, they were at the, um, at the end of the war and in later years. Um, I think the biggest thing for me that was atypical that I had not experienced in my first 34 years um, was what Marin talked about in her article, and that was soft conventional integration. Um, this is something that I had never, ever experienced before. In fact, it was, it was, it was kind of uh, the Army's um, idea of inter-service rivalry. Or, you know, the Navy, you, you've got uh, submariners, mariners, and, and, and um, aviators. Soft was soft forces were kind of the other guys. They didn't like to play with us very often. They, they would come down and indicate they were going to play in a particular exercise, and something always changed uh, that they weren't able to be there for the NTC rotation or some of the other things we were doing. Uh, I did not serve in combat in, in Desert Storm, but I don't think you had the integration you had early on in the war uh, in 2004, 5, 6, and throughout with conventional and soft. And I think there's always a tendency to look at this as the, um, the soft supporting the conventional, but I think you have to understand that there's, there's a two-way street here. There was tremendous support being provided by conventional forces to soft forces. Uh, and hopefully, through the 12 years of these wars, these are lessons we truly will have learned. That the, the, it is absolutely critical to maintain the skills that, are, are, that we've built up, and we've learned so much for, from each other. Uh, I think one of the things where, where we learned so much was in ops intel integration. Um, I, I think that uh, soft because of their acquisition system and their ability to go out, they taught us a lot. I think uh, it was soft who really is the reason why we start, stood up the, uh, the rep, uh, the rapid equipping force. It allowed us to go out and, and look for off-the-shelf solutions to some of the problems that commanders were having. Um, those requirements had to be filled within two years. 80% of them had to be filled within one year. That was the rule uh, with the rep. It broke all the congressional rules because you were literally going out uh, and, and finding things and you didn't really care whose district they were in. You were really going out there to, to fill a requirement. Uh, I give Dick Cody a lot of credit for that. Uh, he told them basically, if, if they're not failing, if you're not failing, uh, you're not doing things right uh, because you really needed to get out and look at that. And, and I think when I look at off-scale integration, what, where I really see it is, it, it was in command and control. Learning so much from the SAW in some of the things they were able to buy and some of the places that they had gone to in command and control, I really opened my eyes to such systems as CPOC. Um, command Post of the Future, uh, was a DARPA project. Um, I basically begged to take 13 systems over in 2004, and, and the rest is, is history. Well, well, it was under DARPA. It was extremely agile. That was my first year, 2004 and 2005. I would literally have people rewrite the software. 
um, when I went to bed at night and when I woke up, and I, I'm a poor hood guy, so when you're talking dropping a new software on me, I start to shake. Um, but they would literally drop it when I was asleep that night, and every time they were able to provide me um, the improvements and command and control and op intel integration that, that, that I had asked for. Uh, the problem was, as all good DARPA things, we had to transition over to the Army Acquisition System. And in 2006, what used to take me a night to get fixed, I didn't get fixed in an entire year. Um, I, I really see some use for these systems and the tremendous advances we have made uh, in not only ops intel integration, but our ability to take large amounts of data and analyze it very, very quickly. The, 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 the work that, that Haas did in getting us through, or at least starting to get us through the problems we had with PED, was when we had so many UAVs pulling down so much information. And, and as I look at my current profession and what I'm doing now, I, I see that uh, in the medical field. I would like to take many of the command and control systems. I, I, I see a real um, transition of many of those systems uh, into the medical field that provide things uh, that are solely lacking uh, in the ability to do things like um, pull the data from a, a number of MRIs together and be able to compare and look at that, those databases. Not unlike what we were doing uh, with full motion video and, 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 and those kinds. Uh, and, and finally, um, non-kinetic. Um, I talked a lot about the non-kinetic effects of this war. I, I believe that these wars have, have changed uh, the face of war forever. The requirement of the integration of kinetic and non-kinetic effects, I think people often forget that. Those that believe only in the kinetic will say that I don't believe those non-kinetic guys. I don't know any non-kinetic guys. I know of kinetic, non-kinetic guys. Guys that believe that they have to integrate both those things together, together on the battlefield. To me, that's absolutely critical. It, it, and, and if you want long-lasting value from that proposition, you've got to ensure that at the same time you have a government portion of this that provides what I think was solely lacking, uh, and solely lacking in Iraq today, and when we left Iraq, and that was the ministerial ca capacity to be able to keep those sewers going, to allow um, the, the potable water to continue to flow, to, to pick up the garbage on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and you know, simple things like even writing contracts proved so difficult for the, the ministry uh, in, in Iraq. And I think many of the problems that you see in Iraq today um, go back to those things. With that, I'll stop and turn it over to Thank you. Um. <coughs> They got to have all the fun. I, I get the other subjects here, but um, you know, I think the first one in real estate, it's location, location, location. In in this activity, it is you know, if if you are going to intervene as a third party in somebody's fight, it's a cost-imposing strategy on the third party, and it's going to take you a minimum of eight to ten years if you want to hang around and see any benefit from that investment. Um, but it's a cost-imposing strategy, and it always, it always has been, and it always will remain so. Um, second thing I think, and I'm just going to click down through these, um, that, that for me was um, a challenge and, and, and something that we weren't really ready for, was that on this electronic battlefield, this information age battlefield, we could move between DOD's Title X authorities the intelligence community's Title 50 authorities and the State Department's authorities at the speed of light. Where was the oversight? Where is the oversight? How, how do you want to think about those kinds of capabilities? Um, it certainly wasn't, oh, I got, a, I got a week or two and I'll go up and brief the Hill on this. Um, we were moving capabilities back and forth at what we thought was response and still believe was response to the battlefield but quite frankly, it was not under the intent that those rules were written um, and the oversight um, mechanisms that were put in place. And so the question now is, how do we want to start to think about that? And we can blame a platform for it, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to start to understand what oversight's going to look like and how we're going to manifest it on a battlefield that is 
really not written according to the 20-year patent laws, but, but lives on Moore's law at 18-month cycles. And 18 months is a real stretch on the battlefield. The IED fight was a 30-day fight. They invented a fuse, we invented a counter, they invented a fuse, 30 days. And if you got any longer than that, then people were dying at a number that, that would not be tolerable. And so how do we start to think about the oversight mechanisms in war between the things that we now have checks and balances in between to, pr to make sure that we're doing what we really want to be doing out there? It's just a challenge. It's going to manifest itself again. Um, we can blame the platforms, but at the end of the day, we got to take a, an inward look at governance. Is this what we want to be doing? Is it responsive? Um, is there some other way of getting what we want to have as, as an oversight mechanism? The, the, the third one in, in this litany of good and other is this battlefield is not driven by platform solutions, okay? Platform solutions take you 15 years to even get into actual metal. So 15 years of debating what the requirement is going through that whole evolution, then you start bu building metal and it's probably another five to 10 years before you feel. And so 20 years ago, you decided what you wanted to use that platform for and what solution you wanted out of it. When it meets reality, it never matches up. In this fight, we did it once. Um, we had to do it, not because we wanted to do it. And that was the mine resistant vehicles. We had to have a platform solution for the problem. But in these conflicts, you're basically taking a maneuver force, turning it into an occupation force, heavying it up, creating things to protect you against IEDs and bullets that are flying on the battlefield, et cetera, and basically reducing your mobility, reducing your ability to go out and actually put fires on the target in a way that you trained to do in the first place. Platform solutions need to be thought of completely different, and I'm, I'm pressing hard in this current wave of acquisition reform, which I've got 40 years of acquisition reform, chapters to tabs. But, but the reality here is we've got to find a way to, to move to be more responsive to the battlefield. And building a platform solution for a problem won't do it. And building a million dollar truck for which five more pounds of homemade explosive means you add two or 3,000 pounds more of armor is a cost imposing strategy on us. And we can't, we can't accept that kind of stuff. We've just got to start to think about how we're gonna handle that as we go to the future. On the good side, um, and I'll just do a couple of these because they've been hit pretty well. Um, re recall the world wars we fought as armies, Vietnam, Korea, we fought as divisions. This fight was brigades. It speaks to the precision, it speaks to command and control it basically tells you that a smaller unit is more, today more lethal for a whole host of reasons, covers a much larger area of regard um, as we go out there and do that. And we're not done doing that yet. We're, we're trying to move to, to be able, whether it's through reach back or drones or whatever it is, to, to make that unit out there able to cover a much larger area, sustain itself, et cetera. People talk about precision and what it did for bombs on target, the number of bombs per target, but the real value, one of the greatest values out of precision was the logistics side of the equation. The amount of rolling stock that we got rid of because we didn't have to move rounds to the front, the amount of people that were necessary to support that, it just goes on and on. It was significant. In this fight, it was no different. And, and that would take me in the reach back area to medicine because Pete touched on that towards the end. You know, in the Civil War, the military came up with a concept called triage. That has remained at the heart of organizing and managing medical services throughout the world um, up until this conflict. And in, in Afghanistan, we got rid of triage. And we went to a system that you now see in, in most of your EMS systems out there also but basically pushing the intellectual capital of, of, a, of a hospital to the front without pushing the people to the front. So sitting there doing first aid with a high school graduate corpsman who's got a iPad, for lack of a better description of it, showing the doctor exactly what he's dealing with, exactly what's going on, 
the doctor saying, patch that, tourniquet that, plug that, get them on the truck. Okay? We went from a likelihood of survival in the 50 to 60 percent through all of the wars up until this time to better than 99 percent most of the time on the battlefield. The only reason we couldn't get, keep you alive and get you back was because you were pinned down by fires and we just couldn't get to you. That's, that's a fundamental shift that's now being pushed over into the medical side. But it's that kind of activity that we're going to have to push on in, in many forms, not just in the medical area. Large data, it's a fundamental shift in how we fight. For years, certainly for Pete and I, if you had a rifle squad of four soldiers, four Marines, and, and a couple of comm guys and a medic along, you were sent out in the morning to patrol the road to see who shot at you, to figure out what was out there and what you were going to have to do about it. Trolling, you know, basically for the enemy. Today, we're, we're really much closer to being predictive about where we go and what we take. You know, we have, a, through these large data analytics, both forensic and predictive, we have moved to an age in which now, with a reasonable 50-50 chance, we can tell you where an ambush is going to occur, what the manifestation of that ambush is going to look like, and what you ought to have along in order to protect yourself. That's a fundamental shift, and we're just at the infancy of, of a lot of that, as is the police now as they use these types of techniques to start to understand what it is that's going on out there and what, what the likelihood is that we're going to be attacked. The four things, four or five things that were absolutely critical in my mind um, to this past 10 years, 12 years of conflict. One, it was paced by computational power. It was purely paced by computational power. Um, that gave us the ability to look at data, gave us the ability to do fire control in ways, reach back, et cetera, in ways that we had never conceived of in the past. The, the fight was paced by computational power. I could tell you every time that we got a new chipset, exactly where I was going to put it in order to give advantage on the battlefield. I just, it was absolutely essential. So that was critical in it. We already talked about the move from platform-based solutions to sensors and open architectures that allowed you to put in what you actually needed for the fight you were in, not what somebody thought you might need 15 or 20 years prior. That was absolutely critical. DARPA. DARPA was incredible in, in, our, in our ability to gain advantage. Par paired with DARPA, universities and small business. Small business and universities were the, were the hotbeds of innovation for us, um, and there was just no way around it. The willingness to take risk in small business and compared to larger businesses, the willingness to turn things at the 50% level rather than the 95% level made a huge difference and saved countless lives on the battlefield. And, and, and I don't know any other way to put it than that was absolutely essential to the way we we're doing business. And I think the, the last point I would make is that precision, all of the systems that we put together out there, reach back, all of these things. When historians look at this, if, if we've got the data reasonably right right now, this is one of the first conflicts, if not the first conflict, in which the population of the affected nation grew in the fight. I don't know the implications of that, um, quite frankly. So in other words, you usually look, don't take this as a sexist remark, you look at the males 17 to 35, that population historically in a fight dwindles to the point that the nations start to be willing to come to the table. That population grew through the entire 12 years in both these fights. Is that a result of precision and things like that? Yes. What are the implications for termination of conflict? What are the implications for what termination might look like as we go forward and whether you're actually terminating or you're just finding some alternate venue by which to fight? I don't know the answer to that yet, but it is out there as an issue that we're going to have to think about. Some ways, these last 12 years, 
did in Saturday night, and it seemed to me that there was um, a, a mixed bag or a, a result of that. On the one hand, I think it reinforced some um, divisions and distrust that were that could be papered over in the classroom that aren't as evident uh, on the consequences of not quite as high. And on the other, clearly there were new relationships formed and, and reliability that was certainly mutually appreciated and, and interdependence, I think. Um, and, and this is also a, an area where I we tend to, in my mind, be perhaps less early on than we uh, might be, at least in open company. So let me ask you in open company, um, if, if you all would like to uh, comment on, was it a mixed result on the jointness front? Was it all positive? Was it 75, 25, one way or the other? What are your assessments of that? Okay. Um, you know, my, my sense is that there was much more positive about joint than there was negative, number one. Uh, number two, I probably know, and, and this would be true of anybody out on the battlefield, more people in more countries' armies, so to speak, where they're, how they're doing, whether they're getting promoted, where they're getting stationed. In other words, the integration was much more at the combined level um, in this conflict than at the joint level. Um, now, that having been said, reflecting internally on joint, um, I think there were three areas where we eventually um, had to make a decision that joint was just not good enough for what we needed to be able to do. That was logistics, intelligence rec reconnaissance and surveillance, um, and the IED fight, um, you know, and command and control with that IED fight. And so those three areas we basically took out of the service world and moved them in to be horizontal across all of the services, but directed at the joint level. You will buy these things, you will attain these capabilities. The services then made sure that they fit in, a, in some logical way, and that was not done without uh, some pain, so to speak, at least long hours of meetings and, 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 and whatnot. But, but clearly in those areas, we needed to move joint. I believe that we were too slow um, for all of the goodness that was done in the medical area moving to joint. And it was just a very difficult thing. Each of the services, in fact, do practice medicine in a different way. And so do I run up to somebody on the battlefield and go, oh, Navy, I'm sorry, and move on? No. And so we, we worked hard and, we, and I'm, I'm relatively comfortable. We did well on the battlefield. We did well in the, in the interim stop in Longstool um, coming back. But once we got back in the States, it was an Army hospital, a Navy hospital, or, you know, whatever. And it just it didn't serve us well, and we need to do better on that. I would, I, I would argue the, the jointness personified was uh, Mike Mullen when he came over as CNO and saw that the problem the Army was having uh, with IEDs and the fact that we had did not have uh, that skill and had gotten rid of, of the skill uh, that so many of his fighter pilots had uh, in electronic warfare uh, and basically went back home and within three weeks uh, had found 220, I think if I remember the number right, uh, pilots who never thought in the world that they were going to end up being over at Baghdad when Washington, D.C. made the amazing decision to put an active jammer in the Marine Corps sector and a passive <laughs> jammer uh, in, with, with Army forces saying that, the, well, the Marines are in the West, the, the Army's in a different place and it won't cause any problems. And I remember uh, getting those two jammers down there and thank God uh, for the Navy and uh, uh, pilots, uh, electronic warfare specialists that uh, we had that allowed us to work through that problem. Uh, I, I think for those who were fighting, uh, jointness uh, was exactly what Goldwater Nich Nichols envisioned. Uh, I think it became a little clouded once you got back into the building. Uh, I think it's fair to say um, we were late on MRAP. We, we probably, and, and even months, it should have been probably at least two to six months to maybe a year before we should have looked at AMRAP, but no one knew how they were going to pay for it until Congress gave us, I believe, $20 billion. Uh, that eased a lot of the uh, concerns, and uh, Secretary Gates, uh, through 
amazing leadership uh, kind of spearheaded that through to, I think we had our first vehicles deployed in, in under a year and a, a large number at the 18 month mark. Um, the, the number one problem for me as a force provider in jointness uh, was individual augmentees. Um, our ability, the Army's ability to provide the necessary number of individual augmentees for all the headquarters and other formations that, that grew out of adapting to, to the enemy um, caused us to go to the other services. And I think if there's any place where there was a little friction, uh, it was the friction of, listen, this is your responsibility. Why aren't you doing it? Why are you coming to us and asking us for help? Albeit, there was never a request that um, what was not met. Uh, but I found uh, jointness probably a little bit um, harder to fully implement in the building uh, and never hard to implement or lack of uh, when you were down there where the bullets were flying. Uh, not having <clears throat> had the personal battlefield experience that, that uh, Pete had, but looking at it, uh, you know, as, as things unfolded, I, I, I think that uh, there were occasions on which my own service uh, was probably uh, uh, late to helping solve some problems. On the other hand, once we identified them, I, I think we jumped on it big time. I can recite a couple of specific incidents. One was when uh, the chief went over and uh, we saw what was happening with the uh, supply runs from Kuwait up to Baghdad. And we, we, we had tactical air lift that we could have been making those runs with and, and taking those people off the roads. And we just weren't doing it because we hadn't been asked to do it and nobody put it forth. And uh, I think it was John Jumper, who was the chief at the time, who said, hey, look, this just doesn't make sense. And, uh, and at the same time, you still had to have a certain amount of stuff moved by, uh, by road. We had people, I, I, I can remember going around during the uh, you know, 2005, 2006 time frame on air bases where in past wars, uh, if you went up to a kid who was a bus driver in a transportation squadron, uh, the likelihood that that kid had been to combat was, was pretty rare. But because of the augmentation as drivers and these kinds of things, I used to ask these kids, how many, how many times you've been in theater? You know, and they'd say twice, whatever. I, I'd go to the club and I'd talk to the fighter guys and I'd say, how many times you've been in theater? Well, we haven't been deployed yet. You know? And so there was that kind of thing that was occurring. There's there another element, and then the other thing was when we tried to take, as, as uh, General Cartwright pointed out, we had platforms that were designed and built 20, 25 years before, and it was the ability to take those things and do things that we never thought about before. For instance, uh, when we took J-STARS and were able to take those J-STARS tracks and go back and, and see where these guys were coming out of the woodwork, it was amazing what you could do for the joint fight that you'd never, not, never thought about. And before we get off this, I would, I would raise one other thing. And I, and I think generally, this has been, this, this last 10 to 12 years, has been the first time in a long time that the total force, the Guard and the Reserve, really stepped up in a big way. And uh, every indication that I have is they did it very well, it helped on, uh, in the battlefield itself, uh, but it also helped with the tie back to the American public. But I, I give the Garden Reserve of all the services uh, kudos for the way they stepped up. I don't know, Pete, whether you... I think that's fair appraisal. It, it helped with this whole op-tempo rotation thing. Without it, we would have, we would have driven everybody in the ground. Um, one more quick question about, uh, and General Fogelman, you touched on this a little bit in your earlier remarks, or I, and I think General Carr, you did as well. Um, what do you think that the primary takeaways from our last 12 years are for our friends, both those who fought with us and those who didn't, but might hopefully in the future if we need them to, 
uh, and adversaries. And, and, and adversaries, adversaries, potential adversaries. What are their lessons? <laughs> um, in, you know, my sense is that um, you know, everybody has gone to school on this that's out there as a friend or as an adversary. Um, they see the networked approach that um, has been taken in a pretty significant way. They've seen the value of precision. They've seen the value of um, knowing where you are <laughs> and being able to, to put effect exactly where we want it, the direction that we're heading in those areas. They will certainly look to thwart those kinds of capabilities or they will look to, okay, how do I afford to be part of that team? Both are going to be questions as we go forward. The good news from my perspective is one, um, if we were to just stagnate right now and stay where we are, we might get five or 10 years of advantage, but there's no intent uh, in stagnating. You know, we are pressing ahead as a nation and in, in the corporate sector, as well as in the military sector for advantage in the information age. Um, and our belief, at least the belief uh, certainly that I've experienced while I was in the service and out, is that the information age is really to do for man what the, the industrial age did for the human body. In other words, steam engine, the internal combustion engine, et cetera, allowed us to do things that no matter how many people you massed in one place, you couldn't have done. We're going to do the same in the cognitive side in the information age. The intellectual power that's going to be out there, whether it be computational on a chip or whether it be what we can apply to it, and the integration of that and putting the human being in the right place for the greatest amount of leverage is certainly the way we are thinking about business and the battlefield. And those types of things and the way we are heading are going to be paced, good and bad, at Moore's Law not at patent law. It's going to turn over very fast, and countries are worried about the ability to keep up. Uh, my, my sense, though, is we're going to have to get over the fact that we're not the only smart people in the world. We're not producing the engineers that we need. Um, we're going to find more and more challenge in that area, and there are other smart capabilities that are going to emerge on the battlefield. That's a reality. That's not probably or maybe, maybe, that's going to happen. And, and the question is, can we, through all of the things that we do as a nation, maintain that cutting edge as we go forward? It'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'll take maybe a slightly different approach and, and uh, talk, talk about uh, sort of a vulnerability of, of the U.S. because of a cultural thing, and that is, I, I think that friends and, ally, and friends and allies and foes and potential foes uh, have probably taken notice of how much value uh, the United States of America puts on a single life, you know, uh, and so it is, it is one of the most precious things that we can do, but at the same time, you know, if you are somebody who wants to rattle our cage or shake us, uh, you don't have to necessarily target large groups of people or whatever. You can go after us one at a time, or you can, you can come up with a system uh, to attack us in that way that, that makes us very vulnerable. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. It's just a fact of life that we have to think our way through in the future as we look at that. And uh, I, I think it has to do with some of the shaping that's going on in the thought process about, you know, uh, we're hearing, well, it'll be a long time before we put big armies on the ground somewhere again and these kinds of things. I, unfortunately, we don't always get to vote on that, you know. And so uh, we can't just go on the basic assumption that that's going to be fact as we go out there into the future. So that's one of these things that I, I think that, uh, that, we, that we need to think about in, in a sense. The other is, uh, is as General Cartwright pointed out, uh, I think we're very much into uh, the great 
equalizer, the great leveler for the kinds of foes we're going to uh, face in the future, most likely, is going to be in the uh, cyber, uh, uh, in the electronic warfare area. These, these capabilities are not cheap, but you don't need massive infrastructure to go develop it and put it onto the battlefield. So this is an area that we really need to continue to pay attention to, I think. So. Uh, I, I think we really uh, got it handed to us in the information area. I can't think of very many information battles that we won. Um, we were constantly outflanked and, and beat to the punch by the enemy uh, in the 24 months that I spent in Iraq. I, I used to, I, I loved hurricanes. Hurricanes were wonderful things because they are, they are, they are made for 24 hours news stations because they, they change every hour. They go a little further, you know, toward Florida or Louisiana or whatever. And I loved it when one formed or two or three um, formed out in the Atlantic because the, the, all attention went off of what we were doing. Um, it, it literally went to that hurricane and that's what was covered. But the minute uh, it either hit land or did a hook out into the Atlantic again, back, they, they were back on us. And, and, and the enemy knew that. He, he knew that. He knew exactly how to react to it. He knew exactly how to set up a scene. He knew exactly how fast we would be able to re react to it to get out information that we were going to have to do an investigation, that the investigation would take so long and there was no way that that investigation would be done. And we were working within a culture that the first story out, no matter how right or wrong it was, was the story was going to be believed, even when you got a witness up in front of the media to explain, no, that's really not what happened. They kidnapped me, and they were getting ready to kill me, and, and the Americans came in and saved my life. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. And I think we, as a democracy, have to figure out how, in this new information age, we are going to begin to win those battles. Because there is so much of this fight that was fought out uh, on that particular battlefield as opposed to the tactical or operational battlefield uh, that many of us were focused on. So the enemy's going to invest in hurricane suppression systems? <laughs> <laughs> Not a uh, bad idea. Well, let me open it up to all of you. Uh, if I could just ask, we've got microphones, I believe, and uh, if people could just identify themselves, state their name and identify themselves. Um, so let's start right here in the middle, just to make it hard for the microphone people. Right up here. There you go, right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's really yeah. Well, yeah. I, we want to record it, I think, so thanks. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. My name is uh, Max Kaler. I'm a major in the U.S. Army. Um, so my question is, there's no doubt we need to return to fundamentals of war fighting, whether it may be individual or collective skills. Um, but how do we take the lessons learned from the interagency process, having, I mean, a massive uh, mobilization of the interagency in Iraq and Afghanistan? How do we take those lessons learned and apply those to us returning to the war fighting skills that we need to do individually? Because what it seems like is going to happen, everybody's going to go their own separate ways, and we're going to have to relearn all these uh, lessons that we've had or establish these relationships again during the next conflict. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, my, my sense is, uh, one, there, there's going to be some stuff that we wish we would have done more with and we'll set it by the wayside as we go through because we're not clairvoyant about what the next war ought to, be look, ought to look like and we'll be accused of the last war. But the, some primary questions that we need to answer for ourselves. The first is, do we want to go back to a maneuver force or do we want to stay with the heavy force that we have? And I think for the most part, people are voting to go back to a maneuver force that it's easier to adapt in a, move, a maneuver force to a garrison or occupation force than the other way around. Okay, so, so that's likely. Then the next is, I don't want to say roles and missions because that evokes some strong emotion, but you have three forces, basically, in the United States. You have the strategic forces, which today are defined as nuclear weapons. The question is, do we want them to be? They also have the responsibility for sa space, cyber, missile defense. So you have that group of force. You have general purpose forces, which are the services, for the most part, um, raised, raised and, and uh, provided for. And then you have the special. What do we want the three of them to do? What does the balance look like? And what does the range of their operations look like so you understand what it is you're trying to do? My sense today would be that 
We're drawing down on the strategic forces, but they're not going to zero. And strategic is going to be more about distance or lack of distance and depth than it is about whether or not it's a nuclear weapon. In other words, there are going to be conventional non-kinetic capabilities, missile defenses, et cetera, that are going to be in the equation as we go forward to buy the time to make up for the fact that there aren't hardly any countries left in the world that want American patches permanently stationed in their country. That's just a reality we're going to have to deal with. What are we going to do about that in the ability to close with the adversary? The general purpose forces are going to have to be agile, have more maneuverability and, and more staying power over greater distances. That's just the way it's going to end up if we're going to have a capability to remain a global power and with global interests, which in my sense is we, we are going to do that. And then the special forces, this is Cartwright's opinion only, okay, are about the intersection between terrorism and state-sponsored or state the state wars. In other words, terrorism now has an intersection that allows it to have a lethality heretofore only allowed in nation states, that Westphalian mindset and, and, and construct. What are we going to do about that intersection? It's likely that you're going to use special forces to basically say to the world, I can find you no matter where you are, and I will find you. And, and, and so how big do we need to be? Do they have a role in things like non-proliferation, counter-proliferation? I think they do. How do we want to equip them? And how do we go forward? I mean, these are basic force posture, force capability questions. What are the balances? Because right now, if you just repopulate and go out and rebuy the strategic forces all over again, you can't afford anything else in the other two. If you keep the special forces just the way they are, then the general purpose forces are going to have to shrink substantially. So it needs to be a debate, and need, we need to understand to do what, and then understand the balance and the investment and the grand strategy side of how we're going to think about that as we go forward. Uh, General Crowley, do you want to talk about the yeah, interagency piece? Uh, just talk about what? Interagency piece. I wasn't going to. Oh, but, <laughs> but I'm sure you well, yeah, do yeah. want to. I've, I've about given up on it because I, I, I just don't think there's any, there's any stomach to, to, to go after it. But, uh, you know, to me there's, there's a couple of issues here. The, the, the first one is, is that as you get old, you understand there are very few lessons learned. There's many lessons observed and a couple <laughs> lessons learned. Um, and, and it really resides with the, the generation that's gone through this. I, 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 I had two tours in Iraq that, you know, that small compared to many of the younger kids who had four, five, and six. But, but I did it as my last child was moving out of the house. I did not do it. Uh, in an all-volunteer force um, with kids who were playing soccer and, you know, moving from kindergarten to, to third grade. I, I, if you would have told me on 911, okay, when I was in the building, when the plane crashed into the building, that we would be able to maintain this thing for 12 years, okay, and not have the recruiting and retention problems that, 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 that we did not have, that Army aviators, that you knew where they were going to be on day 365 and on 366, they were going to be back down range for six years straight. They were on a 12-month home, 12-month deployed rotation schedule. If you had told me we could do that and maintain this all-volunteer force, what's different now, and quit the comparisons to World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, what's different now is you have an all-volunteer force. And the real lesson is if you've got to focus, how are you going to maintain that force? Because I think we're all pretty happy with less than 1% of the population fighting our wars for us. It seems that way anyways. I don't hear anybody calling, let's go back. Well, a couple people are, but that's okay. I really think we have to put some strong thought into, okay, how do we maintain young men like you who have gone through this and maintain you in the service as we go through this piece? And what are the lessons that you're going to remember so as you move up the chain um, for all the old folks who don't get them corrected, you make damn sure they are correct and they move from lessons observed to lessons learned quickly before people die. I, I, just, I would just pick up on one comment there, which is uh, I think the all-volunteer force has served us very, very well. The problem we have going forward is it has become unaffordable at its present size and composition 
So we really need to work this. I'm so pleased that <laughs> my friend the general has decided to get on the compensation and policy committee. But, uh, but seriously, uh, I, I heard something the other day in a, in a session with some senior people where they said that, you know, the budget right now, total personnel costs are about 40% of the budget and uh, very soon to hit 60. And that just, that's just squeezing everything else out. And uh, so we got to find a way to, to do this and not lose the quality of the people that we got. And, I, I, and I'm a guy, I don't, re, I don't begrudge any of the things that we gave to that force in terms of compensation and benefits, whatever, but it is just unsustainable for this country. And so we have got to think about this very seriously. Okay, we'll go right here and then right there. And there, uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Uh, General Cartwright, you're the guy who uh, sparked the question, so you, you can <laughs> play with it first. Um, you talked about how, uh, I'll interpret for you, uh, essentially Goldwater Nichols has in many ways become irrelevant because of uh, the speed of technology and the, the ways in which information are shared. Uh, there's been talk for, what, a decade at least about redoing it. Uh, old laws that are irrelevant are ignored. Um, do we need to shift it? Uh, can we tinker? Yeah, my, my sense is that um, the thought process, the, the intent behind Go Water Nichols um, is, is certainly been the driving force that has given us a lot of advantage and capability. Um, now the question is, is there a counterpart? People have talked about a counterpart, Goldwater Nichols for the interagency as an example. Um, you know, my sense is you, that's tinkering with the Constitution. And, and we've got to take a look at, and what I was trying to get at is, do we really need to go that far? Can we get the leverage that we want and protect what is called in the Constitution the checks and balances, et cetera? Uh, and my belief is that we can, but we have to be careful about the oversight that we're going to skip or, or, or step aside from, number one, and number two, unintended consequences in doing that. Um, and, and so, you know, this is going to be something that is evolving. It will not be, you know, um, let's go down to Key West and change everything. Uh, you know, and so the questions here probably are going to come more from the social aspects that we're going through right now in the information age. I mean, the ability to, to garner information in large quantities, process through it, find the needles in the haystacks, et cetera, is going to come from the battlefield into the commercial sector, et cetera, into government. What are the implications? What do we want there? What do we not want? we have a substantial amount of cultural adjustment as you always do when you change age, sometimes ages, <laughs> um, as we always do uh, down through the generations. There's going to be a renaissance of some sort where we're gonna have to think our way through how we do this stuff in the information age. Um, it's not mature enough right now, is my, my belief, to actually have that conversation today but you can see it being forced on. If you read the people like uh, Toffler and whatnot, this transition goes on for a substantial, think in terms of tens of years, and it generally sparks a lot of conflict. Um, and there's nobody out there that's forecasting that we have stepped away and there's no longer any conflict. There are a lot of people out there who say, I don't want to be part of it anymore. Well, as somebody said already, you, know, you don't necessarily get the only vote on that. And so uh, I think that we have a lot of cultural norms as we start to get into the computational power that opens up genomics, bio warfare, you know, and it goes on and on. What are the implications of all of this and how does it fit together? And is this in line with the spirit of the founding fathers, but not necessarily um, written exactly right, so to speak, or, or ready for prime time? 
Uh, let me, because we're running out of time here, um, I'm, I'm going to get the three that I, if you could all ask your questions very briefly and then one more in the back and then we're going to have to uh, shut it down. I apologize. Jones, I can never remember three I questions. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll write them down. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, Steve. Go ahead. Steve Winters, uh, security researcher. I, I, one thing that strikes me when I think back on Vietnam was that the enemy had a very clear face. For example, General Giap recently passed. Uh, but when I think uh, of um, Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, from your standpoint, is there somebody you identify looking at it who's a figure of that stature? You always just hear about these nebulous people. And even Zakawi, if you say he was, uh, he was a disaster from the political standpoint. So you can't really even uh, say him. But from your standpoint, was there a personal face to the enemy? Or just little guys making IEDs out in the ways? I mean, who gets the credit for the, yeah. their success? Get the questions in yeah. Okay, let me just get the questions first, because I think I fear we won't get through them. If Neil Cosby, I'm consultant to DARPA. Uh, it strikes me that uh, the uh, political leadership of the country, the Hill, the White House, and uh, those in the Pentagon, learned a different lesson. There seems to be, for the future, no boots on the ground. And that seems to work okay for the Air Force, Navy, Army Air, but um, how about the uh, Marine, uh, ground forces, Marine and Army? Yeah. Do they have an mission now in the future? And is that, uh, do, are they working on uh, robotic squads, robotic platoons, robotic companies? What's the future there? And then, right back there, that one right there. And then. Thank you. Uh, Christine Vargas Avison and SICE graduate, uh, very simply put, uh, as a communications professional, I'd be very interested to hear General Fogelman elaborate on the top three capabilities held, um, the top three capabilities you would like to see our information warriors develop, uh, because we certainly will need them for irregular warfare going forward. And then in the back, right there. Doug Morrison from DuPont, retired Army, and I'll put it simply, cyber. If we're gonna have reach back capabilities, but yet extend the network down to the tactical edge. That opens the force up to a significant vulnerability. Uh, okay, so let's start with the face of the enemy. Anybody? You know, that's, that's been the challenge and always will remain the challenge of counterinsurgency, number one. It rarely has a single face. Um, and then the intersection of terrorism and state warfare um, you know, in this empowered individual world that we're in um, is going to be a challenge. What's interesting here, and supports your thesis to some extent, is when you look at the Arab Spring, um, when you look at that, one, uh, there, there isn't a Lefluenza or a Nelson Mandela to emerge, um, and, and probably for very good reasons, uh, very bad reasons, really, um, they were eliminated so they couldn't emerge. Um, is that what we're going to have to deal with as we go forward? We have to start to understand that mindset and the ability of crowds to act as causes, uh, for lack of crowdsourcing, similar type. So I think that's going to be your big challenge there. There were all, all kinds of faces that I looked at every day that were number one IED guys that we wanted to take out. I don't know if I can remember any of them right now. Um, but there were plenty of them. And, and there was definitely a face for the enemy at the time. Um, I, I think the problem is we, we tend to think like that. And I, I think the, for the American people, the face of the enemy was Osama bin Laden. And when, once he left, everything was going to be OK, uh, it, which is the, the, the real issue here. It's, it's not OK, OK? And there are still boards uh, that are covered with faces, like I used to look at, of people that will soon be forgotten um, but are the enemy today, and, and they continue to, to multiply over time. I, I guess I would look at the face, faces of the enemy uh, a little bit from the look forward kind of thing, it, because you get into this concept uh, of uh, the military is always accused of fighting the last war, being very poor at identifying the future enemy, and uh, 
And the flip side of that is that you glob on to a, an obvious enemy before they are your enemy and you turn them into your enemy. And so you, you do all of your, you start postulating about all the capabilities you need is to do this. You know, whether it's, uh, you know, aerial denial or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And so you've got to watch that, uh, that you're not too quick to identify the face of the enemy of the future. Uh, I think Pete said it right. I mean, he had lots of faces. There are places at special ops that still have those boards. There are places around the world. Uh, so that would be my only caution on the face of the enemy. And particularly as we start, whether we pivot, we rebalance, whatever we do, uh, we need to make sure that we don't overcommit. On the, on, the, on the future of ground forces, um, I, I think this is cyclical. I, I really do. I mean, as I sat there and prepared for testimony, uh, I went back and, and, and looked at what happened after World War II, after Korea, after Vietnam. Uh, I, I remember after Desert Storm when we decided to take, go from 700 down to 5 or 450 or 480. Um, Gordon Sullivan did a 30 minute tape in which the 32nd Chief of Staff of the Army told us all uh, 36 times in 32 minutes, I'll never forget it, no more Task Force Smiths, um, referring back to what had happened in Korea with Task Force Smith. Um, I, I, I don't fear that there won't be another opportunity for ground forces, I, I hope there isn't. I hope my brethren in the and the, 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 the Navy and the Air Force can handle this all by themselves, but I don't think that's realistic. Uh, I, I think there's going to be a need. The key is, uh, as pressure goes to, to take out the, the ground forces, how do you maintain a force uh, that, is, that is relevant and, and mostly, most importantly, not a task force, Smith, a, a force that when you call upon it, uh, it, it, it is trained and ready to go. But again, we really need to think our way through. You cannot build up an all-volunteer force as quickly as you could a draft army. You just can't do it. I mean, it took us a year and a half, okay, to grow 20,000 uh, when we needed uh, an end strength increase because we were forced to come off stop loss. Uh, 20,000 privates to bring in, that's no leadership. It took us a year and a half to bring that force on and, and get it in position. Um, it is a slow, slow process, so we really need to think our way through that. And embedded in your question, I think, was also this issue of presence on the battlefield. And, um, you know, I, I oftentimes, when I have this conversation, go back, there are some wonderful paintings of the Battle of Gettysburg. And you look at the frontage, and you look at muskets, and you, the first thing that any soldier that takes up, goes up there and does a battlefield walk learns is, I'm right there to you, okay? That's how it was. And there's always a second echelon right behind me. And if you look at their weapons, they're pointed right at your back. And that's what we had to do in a non-volunteer force, et cetera. We believed, certainly I did, well, I don't know, <laughs> probably not, but we believed the bomber guys coming from Guam were not really part of the war. They were way too far and they went back home and it was nice and it was wonderful and we didn't send them to school, and we didn't promote them the same way, and we didn't give them medals until we finally had to understand that the fundamental shift that had occurred, and it's continuing to occur. I mean, the battlefield itself now spans the earth. But I'll be the first to tell you, and Ron can jump in here, the people that we have in places in the United States that fly these remotely piloted aircraft have a higher suicide rate a higher divorce rate, have PTSD from these, from these fights, and they have to take it home with their kids and their family every night. Um, it, is, it is a different battlefield, um, and I, I kind of push back and rebel a lot of times when people say, oh, they weren't really part of it. The question I think that's valid is, outside of an area of conflict, are we going to stay with the congressionally passed authorized use of military force, which means I can go into any country where I believe there is somebody who, who, who could come after us or who has shown a proclivity. Are we gonna stay with that concept and that law, or are we going to shift back to something more normative, um, which really is the law of armed conflict and areas of hostility declared, Congress saying this is a war, et cetera. I mean, that tension is out there right now, 
The question is where we're going to go on it. But to the extent that we continue in this limbo area that we're in today with AUMF, then the question becomes, do I want to put boots on the ground in a country I'm not at war with and be patrolling around there? And what, what's my justification for doing that? It is not that I can't find a 19-year-old that's willing to take the risk. That's not the issue. Uh, the information warriors, what, we, what do we want out of our future information warriors? Uh, there are probably many people better qualified to answer that question other than I, I would say that uh, in general, we want people who understand what effective defense uh, in the cyber business is. And an effective defense is not a rampart. It's not a wall that you're trying to put up to keep somebody from coming in. Effective defense really encompasses a tremendous amount of intelligence on, you know, you know battlefield intelligence in a sense. How's this person going to try to attack me? What are, you know, what are the things that I can do to help defend my system? I think that's, that's a, a very key part, if you will, is uh, defensive tools, if you will. By the same token, I, I want to have offensive capabilities, if I can, that will go against what I understand to be their key nodes. And that, in, again, is intelligence preparation of the battlefield, you know, what's important, what are just uh, stalking horses, these kinds of things. So these are the kinds of tools I think that you want. And then um, the third thing is not so much the responsibility of the uh, information warriors or the cyber people, but it is a good understanding of what are the workarounds. In other words, what happens when the defense fails or the overhead constellations are brought down or whatever. We really need to pay some attention to what are the old-fashioned ways. It may not be motorcycles and messengers, but we may on occasion find ourselves there on the other hand. So, you know, and I, I would jump in. With, um, one of the more difficult things, at least for me during this conflict, was all of the, well, gosh, have you, have you thought about what happens if, you know, what if GPS fails. What if, you know, on and on and on, and people wanting to go back to sextants and star shooting and land nav and all of those things. Quite frankly, that that likelihood is certainly possible. Certainly should have a strategy, just like, you know, Hertz will have a fleet of X kind of cars, but then they'll have a smaller subset that's a different kind of car to protect against it. We do the same thing in weapons. We use, we have weapons that need GPS and we have weapons that don't need GPS. We have capabilities that require networks and we have capabilities that don't. So that, that isn't what paces warfare, quite frankly. It is the, the breakout capability that gives you leverage and gives you advantage and surprises you in the face of your adversary to the point that your adversary can't quite figure out how you got where you got, okay? And, and so you can't not do this stuff, but what you do want to do, which I think is what you're facing, is think about it, think about the alternatives. My bias is that if you don't under the, understand the offense, you cannot build a good defense, okay? Um, and I, at the end of the day, and a defense only has never succeeded in any conflict. Uh, we were good at kicking this off on, in good military time and have failed somewhat because I'm a civilian and ending it on time. Thank you all very much for staying with us. Thank you all so much uh, for a great discussion.